Hi, ladies. Um, I am super excited to be here tonight. I'm so excited to be standing up and with you all. So, um, like Nicole said, we're finishing up First Timothy, and this chapter, um, chapter six, is it's just really packed full. There's so many things in here. So, um, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Lord God, just thank you so much that you are an amazing God. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you care enough that you instruct us in your word and that you give us warnings to heed. And I just ask that you will just be with all of us tonight. Help to take any distractions out of our minds. Help us to just totally focus on you, um, to learn more about you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. So, starting off... Pastor Ryan gave me, like, big instructions. Don't touch the mic. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, all right. So starting in Chapter 6. So uh, I am reading from the ESV. Um, and it is also up on the screens here. So it says... Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. So this first section, um, Paul is, um, he's speaking of bond servants, which also could be slaves, um, and their masters, so it's their, their relationship together. Um, at this time in the Roman world, uh, there were about 60 million slaves, and um, Rome really ruled, ruled the world at this time, um, and the slaves actually made up about half of the population. Um, now, when we are talking of slaves here, um, so this is first century slavery. Um, for the most part, it is different than probably what we think of when we think of slaves. Um, many of them were very well educated. Uh, there were teachers, there were artists, there were tutors, um, doctors, and a lot of the slavery was actually related to financial debt. So if they um, couldn't pay off their debt, they would have to work it off. Um, now, going into verse 2, so stating that if you're a Christian and your master is a Christian, um, he's saying don't be disrespectful. Um, there were some of these bond servants that would think, well, if I'm a Christian and then my master is also a Christian, then, well, wouldn't they have more grace for me or more forgiveness? Uh, maybe they should like forgive my debt or maybe they should just go easier on me. Um, but Paul is saying here, um, don't, don't think that way. He's like, you need to be even more respectful because they are a brother in the Lord. Um, and he's saying you still need to pay them back because they're worthy of it. So in today's world, we can kind of relate this to um, like a boss and employee relationship. And um, as we know, as Christians, the world is always watching us. Um, they're watching our actions. They're watching um, what we say and how we do things. Um, so we need to work hard. Um, you know, if we're, if we're working for, an, for a boss, then we need to put in our full day's work, um, not clock out early, not try to cheat the system. Um, because we want to glorify God in everything we do. And no matter if our boss is a Christian or not a Christian, um, we're all, we're working unto the Lord. And we don't want to bring any shame to his name. Um, and then as we continue on, um, in verse 3, it says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So, this section is um, a big part on false teachers. Um, and just to kind of remind us, um, so Paul is writing this, 
and it's about just a little over 30 years um, after the gospel really penetrated the earth. Um, so this tells us that even then there were false teachers um, and all throughout history that has been the same and today as we know they're all around us. Um, I believe one of Satan's most powerful tactics um, is planting false teachers just all throughout us like even in our church. Um, not our church here, but in church in general. <laughs> um, and they, they dilute the word of God and they twist scripture. Um, and, but this doesn't necessarily mean just pastors. Um, it can be people in the church. Um, so it's not always just being taught from the pulpit that's false. It can be even just in private conversations that we have with each other um, or in small settings. Um, so they're hard to pick out sometimes because they do use scripture a lot. Um, and you don't ever hear anyone announce like, oh, hey, I'm actually a false teacher and I want to deceive you. Like they are, are typically pretty sneaky about it. Um, so how do we know who they are? Um, I think that's an important thing to be able to recognize. Um, number one, there's two things that we have here. Um, the most basic one is because they teach differently than what scripture says. Um, so that's the first one. They teach differently than what scripture says. And then the second one, how do we know who they are, is because when we evaluate the fruit in their lives, we either see fruits of the spirit or we will see works of the flesh. So fruits of the spirit, like the song's probably going off in your head right now, but like the love, joy, peace, um, those are the kinds of things that we would see in someone teaching sound doctrine. Um, works of the flesh, that could be pride, jealousy, idolatry, division, and that's what we would more so see in that. And then um, an important part is how do we stand guard against them? Um, no scripture. That's pretty much um, a very, seems so basic, but um, if they're using scripture um, to twist it, we must know it. We must know what scripture truly says. And this only comes from spending time with the Lord, spending time in his word, um, asking him for discernment. Um, there is a quote from Spurgeon that says, the devil is not afraid of a dust-covered Bible. And I thought that was so um, true for this day and age with false teachers. Like, if we're not digging into the word, then how are we going to be able to guard and protect ourselves against um, those false teachers that are trying to just push us away? Um, we don't have to turn there, but in Acts 20, um, verses 27 through 30, I'm just going to paraphrase for you, but um, Paul is saying here that he taught the whole counsel of God. Um, and why did he do that? Because um, a few verses later he says that he knew after his departure that there would be fierce wolves that would come in. And he said, um, from among their own selves. Um, and they would twist the words to draw them away from the Lord. So Paul is... I believe very passionate about this because he has spoken of it many times throughout here, but um, just how important it is to learn the whole counsel of God. Um, we are super blessed to be in a church, I believe, that literally teaches through the entire Bible verse by verse, um, and there's so much value in that. Um, and then verse 5, so this is just another characteristic of false teachers thinking that godliness is a means of gain. Um, and gain here means financial wealth. Um, uh, David Gusick, he says it, I think he says it best, so I'm just going to read what he, he wrote on this. He said, when the gospel is marketed this way, it makes followers of Jesus who are completely unprepared for tough times. It takes the focus off Jesus himself and puts the focus on what he will give us. So, um, I'm sure most of us have heard, um, probably on TV and things, different, these different um, teachers that tell you if you just have enough faith, um, 
if you are godly enough, um, then you will, you can name it, you can claim it, you can be rich, talking about the riches of this world. Um, but rather, as we read on in verse 6, um, he tells us, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So what is godliness? Um, some different definitions of it is that it's surrendering to God. Um, it's an authentic walk with the Lord. And it's living an obedient, God-centered life. And then contentment, it does not come with the possession of material things. Um, it's it often grows over time, and because it doesn't always come easily or naturally to us, it does take time. Um, Paul says in Philippians um, chapter 4, it's 11 through 13, um, again, I'm paraphrasing, um, that he has learned to be content. So you can see that that is a process. And how did he learn to be content? It was because he had times of plenty and he had times of need. Um, I think living here in the United States, we have so many blessings for so many reasons. Um, however, I do believe it also comes with the challenge of finding contentment because our culture is constantly um, telling us we need more. We need more money, we need more cars, we need a bigger house, we need to have more beauty, we need to, we're always needing more. Um, but we actually need to learn to enjoy what God has given more than grieve what he has not given us. Um, and we go on to verse seven, it says, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. Um, you may recognize that, that um, Job actually speaks of that um, in chapter 1. But um, So it's pretty simple. We don't take any of our material possessions with us. Only the things that we store up for eternity um, really are what count. Um, there was like this little thing that I heard that said, you don't ever see a hearse with a U-Haul being pulled behind it because we just, we literally can't take any of our possessions with us. Um, and if we think about things that are so important to us here on earth, such as gold, um, that's pretty valuable. But in heaven, it says that gold is used for pavement. Um, so that just kind of helps us put things in perspective. And then going on to verse 8, it says, But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. So, food and clothing. Um, clothing can also mean like a covering, like a shelter. Um, so, if we add that in. So, food, clothing, a shelter, he says that is, that's what we need. Like, that's what we need for material things here. Um, and that one, I have to... To sit on for quite a while because I can say with my mouth that I believe that because that's what scripture says but if we truly like think on that like do we really believe like that's all we need to be content with in this world um, and then going on so verse 9 says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Um, so this section is a warning specifically for those who desire to be rich. It's not necessarily for those who are rich. Um, that comes later on, but the desire to be rich. I read a statistic that said, as of last year, there are six in 10 Americans who say they are striving to be a billionaire. Not millionaire, but a billionaire. Um, and that is crazy to me that that is six out of ten Americans um, just striving for something like that. Um, once the love of money takes hold, there's no kind of evil which it will not lead to. And it is 
uh, important to note here that it does say that it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil and not money itself. Um, but, okay, picture a tree um, with roots. And I would have drawn this for you so you could have a visual, but um, it's well known in my house that I am not the artsy one. It's my husband. And um, literally when it comes to like anything, crafts, Legos, costumes for VBS, um, he has to do it. And one of my children recently mentioned to me, like we were doing one of these projects and he said, oh, that's okay, mom. I'll wait for dad because you know, you're just not that good at this stuff. <laughs> uh, which I was relieved, but also very offended. Um, but, um, so here's the tree, and then we have the root down here. And like scripture says, that is the, 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 the love of money. And then from there, um, everything kind of comes up. It grows, and then it has branches. And the branches are representative of just like all the kinds of sin that can come from that love of money. Um, and when we, when you have that desire for that money, um, and you're attaining that, you're now susceptible to so many more things um, that the enemy tries to lure us in with. Um, you're going places that you probably wouldn't have gone before. You can afford things that you couldn't have before. Um, so it's just so important to really take heed of this. Um, so money buys us stuff, but it's such an illusion of security. Um, I don't know who to give credit to for this next section, but um, I really liked it, so I wanted to include it. Um, so it says, money can buy a house, but not a home. It can buy companionship, but not friends. It can buy a bed, but not sleep. And it can buy entertainment, but not happiness. And it can buy a good life, but not eternal life. And I just thought that summed it up so well. Um, so moving on into verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we not get caught up in the desires mentioned in the above uh, passage? Um, so three things here. The first thing to not get caught up in these desires is to flee them. Um, he's very clear, flee, turn around, run from them. Um, so we need to flee the pride and the desires for riches. And then I love that he tells us to flee. So he says, okay, stay away from this. But instead of leaving it at that, he tells us what we should pursue instead. Um, so number two would be pursue. And that is the list that is right here for us. So pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. And then the third of how to not get caught up in this is how he tells us, he says, fight the good fight of the faith. Um, so what does he mean when he says the faith? Um, that's the truth, that's the scriptures, that's what we hold on to. We can't have an unhealthy desire for money and also fight the fight of the faith. Um, scripture tells us that we can't serve both God and money. We will love one and hate the other. And as you know, we are in a constant spiritual battle, so we can't have our sword drawn and ready for the battle if we still have a hold on to the love of riches and the desires that this world lures us in with. And, and then in verse 12, um, where it says, okay, it says, to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Um, so this tells us that Timothy was called by God, but he also freely chose God too. Um, he took a bold stand in his relationship with Christ. 
And then in verses 13 and 14, um, the, the part talking about Jesus making the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Um, we don't have time to really get into all of that tonight, but there are a couple references. Um, John chapter 18 and chapter 19, and then also Matthew chapter 27. Um, so just kind of briefly, how did Jesus make the good confession in front of Pontius Pilate? Um, number one, with his words, um, he spoke truth in front of him and to him. And then also with his actions, um, he voluntarily died on the cross. And um, you'll note when you go back, if you read those, that there are times that Jesus, he did remain silent and he didn't, he didn't speak, but it was his actions that really spoke the loudest for that. And then moving on to verses 15 and 16, um, this section I really, really love. Um, it says, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So we see all throughout scripture the attributes of God. And sometimes it seems like even they'll be in random spots, and I know they're not random, but um, the, you'll be reading along, and then it's like, bam, like there's like a list of God's characteristics, and um, some of those have really stuck out to me, and I think that's so cool how um, they're just put throughout scripture. Um, so this is a good reminder for Timothy, um, but it's also a good reminder for us too. Um, so we need to it's so good for us to sometimes just set our eyes on the Lord and just worship him. Um, it was a few years ago I had a friend that uh, taught me that she would pray, just pray to the Lord and just pray his attributes to him. Um, and I started doing that just at different times and it's so cool because it's like even if you're just anxious, if you're depressed, if your mind is just filled with the worries of this world, um, if sometimes you just find you go to the Lord and you're just giving him your list of wants and needs and complaints um, and you know that you need to be doing more than that, um, it's just such a cool way to completely take the focus off from me and put it onto him um, and just really worship him. And then going on into the next section, verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So now he is the section he's speaking to the rich. And I think we are hesitant to put ourselves in that category, um, but we are here, we live in America, and we're like in the top percentage. So listen up, because this is us. Um, so there are obviously different varying levels of richness, um, but I believe all of us that we, for the most part, um, even if we live paycheck to paycheck, we are still considered rich in this world, and um, we get to choose what we're going to eat, not whether we're going to eat. So um, he is telling us here that we should... I should back up. We should take note also that um, this section, he doesn't say in here that it's a sin to be rich. Um, there were men in the Bible that um, we know were rich, like Abraham, Isaac, Job, just to name a few. Um, but these are the warnings that the Lord um, has given us because he knows how easy it is for us to put our trust in our riches, sometimes without even realizing it. He commands us here to be generous, um, to be givers. This will 
help us to guard our hearts um, from trusting in these uncertain riches that he talks about. Um, I will have you guys turn to um, Mark 10. We're going to start in verse 17. Uh, this is probably a passage that is very familiar to most of you. It's of the rich young ruler. Um, and it's actually, this account is in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I'm choosing Mark because there are two words that are in here that are not found in the other ones. And I really love this part. So um, starting in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So the, the two words in there that really jumped out at me when I was reading this um, were the two words, loved him. Um, Jesus loved him. And I think that is just amazing that that is included in here um, and a reminder that he loved him he loves us and this is why he gives us these instructions and warnings it's not because he wants to withhold um, any fun material possessions and things from us uh, but he knows the dangers that can come with that and the rich young man he couldn't sell his things because he loved them more than he loved God um, and this um, section here that just really exposes his heart in that. Um, and we have a quote from our very own Nicole. <laughs> um, it, she said, sometimes the things we think we want will actually destroy us. And I thought that was very profound <laughs> for this especially. Um, and then one more thought on this section. So Jesus when he was on the earth, he could have had any of the riches that he wanted. He could have had any home. He could have he could have had anything. Um, but when we look at his life here on earth, he chose to live very simply. Um, and there's scripture verse also that talks about how it says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Like he didn't even have a home here on earth. And I just thought that was very interesting because when we're looking to who we want to follow after, um, it's Jesus. And he lived very, very simply. So then going to the last couple verses here, it says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Um, so the first part here, the guard, the deposit. Um, so the gospel. So he needs, he's being told, like, guard the gospel. Um, and that is given by God. Um, and then the second part, um, when he's saying, avoid um, the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Um, that's what comes from man. So we must do all that we can to guard this, as he tells us here. So in closing, um, I just think we should challenge ourselves um, to examine our hearts and really ask, like, are we content in Christ and in Christ alone? Can we actually say, Lord, whatever you send my way is fine with me because I trust in you completely. Okay, let's pray. 
Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for your instructions and your warnings. And thank you that you love us so much. And you are such an amazing God. And I just ask that as we um, reflect back on this chapter, that um, you will just expose things in us that we need to confess to you, that we need to change in our lives, and just help us to really follow after you. In your name we pray. Amen. So Brooke is going to come up in just a minute and tell everybody where they're going and what groups. Um, but tonight we're just going to be in smaller groups, so like groups of three. And uh, we're really going to concentrate together. Um, you'll get sheets from your group leaders. And um, it actually has the alphabet letters there. And it's just to... Um, write out as many attributes of God that you can come up with together and this is so you can bring this home with you so that like we were talked about earlier when you have times of you just don't even know what to pray sometimes um, just take this list out and literally just worship the Lord and pray his attributes to him so after you all do that together then um, we're just going to spend time in prayer and there is the act model, the acronym ACTS, that Nicole taught us a few retreats ago. Um, and if nothing I'm saying makes sense, your group leaders know what's going on, so you can definitely ask them. But um, So um, the A stands for adoration, so you literally can pray the attributes that you'll be coming up with together. And then C is for confession, that's just confessing anything to the Lord that um, you might need to have taken care of. And then the T is thanksgiving, and that's giving thanks, and that's different than the adoration. Um, and then the S is supplication, which is asking him. Those are things that we're asking him, our needs and wants and things. So I just want to encourage anybody that um, is not typically, if you're not comfortable with praying out loud, um, I just want to really encourage you that you are with a group of ladies that love the Lord and love you. So try to like go outside of your comfort zone tonight if you can and just pray in your small group. Um, I can guarantee that probably everybody here that does pray out loud um, at one point had a very uncomfortable time <laughs> in life me included, that you were like forced to pray and you were like, this sounds so ridiculous coming out of my mouth, but um, it blesses the Lord and it will bless everyone in your group too. So I just encourage you with that. Thanks. <laughs>